Hello, everyone. Uh, so, um, I'm uh, Olivier. I created a startup uh, in France in 2012. But basically, I'm uh, a former system administrator and I created the Zen Orchestra and XCP NG projects. So, uh, I'm more used to open source. I don't like to manage complicated licensing on uh, software. So, this is a kind of something that will uh, drive how we build products uh, in general from Zen Orchestra to XCPNG. So uh, a quick survey, can you raise your hand if you are using, if you, yeah, if you are using Zen server, okay, using a bit, and if you know about Zen server at least by name, yeah, okay, so it's, it's infamously known. <laughs> so okay, um, I make a quick recap of what is Zen server. So. Uh, by the way, it's rebranded recently uh, as Citrix Hypervisor for some marketing reason. Uh, it's a turnkey solution. So that's interesting with Zen Server is that you got multiple components built inside one uh, ISO that you put in your server and it just works. So there is Zen, which is the hypervisor itself. Zen uh, is a fully open source project uh, hosted in the Linux Foundation. It's, we could call Zen as a kind of micro kernel itself. It, it boots before Linux is booting. Uh, there is a DOM0, which is a privileged domain, where uh, you run all the command to administrate, for example, uh, you are a Zen server, and it's based on a modified CentOS. And around this, you got a lot of what I call the glue, uh, Python scripts, the API, uh, and the tool stack, which is the, the best way to manage your uh, Zen server host. So Zen server is uh, all of this uh, package in one product. So the story uh, is uh, it started in uh, 2007 when uh, Zen was acquired by uh, Citrix. And as you may know, Citrix is a close partner of Microsoft for, uh, I mean, historical reasons. Uh, mainly Citrix is selling uh, remote desktop products, so you can access a Windows desktop from whatever you, you like, whatever you want. So uh, their customers at the time were mostly Windows users, so they couldn't really sell easily something that's based on Linux. So they tried to hide a bit uh, what is Zen server behind. So uh, um, they decided to to develop a kind of a repo for API, which is called the Zappy, and this API is used by the Windows client, which is called Zen Center. So as you can see from the start, it wasn't something uh, done for a Linux user or uh, maybe uh, easy to use for a Linux user. For example, uh, there is really strange pack system that you need to use to update your Zen server host. So it's kind of SP1 and that kind of stuff. So that's more, you know, Windows thingy uh, in general. So if you're a Windows admin, then when you're going to dig inside Zen server, you are facing a Linux console. So it's a bit confusing. And when you're a Linux user, uh, you are trying to use a product and not really understanding when there is a, a strange pack system. So those are, uh, I would say, marketing and political decision. But behind uh, uh, Zen server is really, really a powerful system. So when I say it's bad, I, I don't say it's bad technically speaking. I say it's bad in the way they built the product. So uh, maybe you can blur my face, you know, when Citrix will see this presentation. But uh, um, in short, um, when you try to do your product, if you decide to do it your own way, uh, I mean by that not being close to other open source projects, etc., then you need to put a lot of resources to do that. So if you are VMware, that's fine, because you know VMware, there are a lot of people working on the product every day, so they continue to maintain it, etc., etc. So they can pick some bits from different systems and ideas, and it works. But Citrix decided to stop competing directly uh, with uh, VMware on the server virtualization market. I insist on the server virtualization market because Citrix is more focused on the uh, remote and desktop virtualization market. So it's not exactly the same stuff. So they decided basically to drop the competition in, in the direct way and they decided to, well, uh, we're done with that, then we will open source the project and magically uh, people will come into the project and write patches and improve the project. So, uh, the problem here is uh, open source doesn't work like that. It's just not, you know, putting the code somewhere on GitHub or uh, whatever you want and uh, people will come to, to help your project. You need to do some efforts to do that. So it's not really open. 
This is, I would say, uh, one of the problem uh, of the, not a technical problem again, but uh, I would say a product decision problem. So what it said, it should be really open, what it means to be really open. So uh, I just made a small list of explaining how you can do an open source product. So when you do that, the idea is to be the closest possible of the upstream. Uh, if you use, for example, CentOS, then do the less modification possible on the CentOS or try to uh, stay up to date with the upstream because otherwise it's a lot of work to maintain your own stuff. Um, the example is their strange update system, which is not using uh, the classical YUM update for a CentOS, but using a kind of pack, which is really, really strange. And it doesn't help to have uh, people using it really in a broader range, even in your own lab, etc., because it doesn't sound normal to use against uh, a classical CentOS. Also, if you do really open source project, you tend to avoid to make some complicated forks. By that I mean uh, for Zen server they had to make a fork of QMU to make some modification. That's fine, but uh, the fork grew uh, too much. So it was really a problem. Uh, it was fixed maybe I would say last year or so when they decided to go more upstream and to push the changes inside QMU directly, but this is relat relatively new. An open source project should be easy to contribute to. Uh, by that I mean not especially on the technical side, but at least you should have contribution guidelines, uh, you should accept uh, code changes with pull requests, etc. That wasn't the case until recently in uh, Zen Server. Also, you should share uh, your development. Um, I mean by that, if you have a GitHub repository, or just a Git repository, uh, your master branch should be available to everyone. So before you even you know, make a release, uh, people can test it, play with it, or maybe report some bugs, etc. So before there is an actual release, you have inputs from your users or your beta testers. It's not the case. You, you can have access to that for some piece of code of Zen server. It's also a good idea if it's possible to share your nightly builds. If you have a complex platform like Zen server, it could be useful for people that aren't able, for example, to build it from the sources, but they just want to test what's coming for explore the new features, etc., etc. So it's not possible again uh, with Zen server. So that it was the case maybe uh, three years ago, but it's not the case anymore. Also, you have to be really careful when you introduce some proprietary software inside your open source product. I mean, that's okay to do that, but if you do that and it breaks the build when you try to build with open source code, that's not a good thing. So there is a component uh, appeared maybe uh, four months ago in Zen Server that exactly does that. So, uh, and basically they don't really care about it. And finally, uh, it would be great if you decide to not introduce uh, trademark content in your open source packages because uh, when you do that, well, you can't redistribute the package directly because it con contains, for example, a Citrix logo, okay? So uh, this is probably done on purpose, but anyway, this is not uh, a good way to to prove that you are doing something really open source. So that's why I call Zen Server not really open source. But again, uh, this is not a technical problem. This is a culture problem. So uh, the result is, uh, in just last January, uh, you got something that a lot of people know, by name at least, here. It's really a powerful hypervisor, but the problem is uh, it's a kind of a niche hypervisor today, okay? Because it's targeting more uh, virtual desktop than server virtualization, and it works for people that have to work with this kind of load. But otherwise, uh, you, as a user of Zen Server, you have the impression that there is no progress on how, uh, or innovation on how the hypervisor is, uh, is developed uh, by Citrix. It, it makes sense, and it makes sense because in the end, uh, uh, it's not the priority for Citrix to develop that because they decided to stop to uh, compete with uh, the server virtualization world. And recently, maybe you heard of that, they decided to change the license uh, and they decided to uh, remove some feature that they got in the uh, free edition of Zen Server. So uh, this is really uh, important because a lot of people were using the free version and uh, they discovered one day then uh, you can't live migrate a VM with a storage from another host to another one because now you need to buy uh, a license. So this is also the lack of 
uh, vision on, on your product that can you know, uh, make people going away into another hypervisor. So this is uh, the, the current state uh, of, of Zen server. So I, I will open uh, uh, a kind of a parenthesis regarding uh, the product we, we, we've done in the meantime. Uh, back in 2013, um, we decided then that Zen Server will be a great platform to develop a web UI on top of it. So this is Zen Orchestra, okay? Uh, because the API, as I said, is really powerful. So for us, it was easy to say we, we don't want uh, actually to have to install a Windows just to use their clients to manage our server. So we decided to create uh, a web UI, a, a web management solution for Zen Server. So that's how Zen Orchestra is born. Okay, so this is just uh, an example of the dashboard. So just to, to make things uh, uh, clear, uh, it started to be a web management tool like a kind of vCenter, you know, something like that. And then we added step-by-step -step new features like backup or VM delegation, etc. So today the main selling point of Zen Orchestra is doing backup on Zen server. So from the start we decided it won't be a Zen Center clone, which is the, the Windows uh, uh, client thing. We, we, we had the uh, vision on the product, and it's open source, by the way. The vision was to say, uh, we want something that just works, and that you plug on your Zen server host, and you got a web UI, and you don't have to install anything on the host. So it's agentless, and it, in one minute, you can connect all your infrastructure, and it works. So this is what we are basically uh, selling with uh, Zen Orchestra. So this is about the context, OK? Uh, we did a lot of stuff with an orchestra. As, as I said, we started just as maybe, you know, manage your VMs, migrate, access the console. But then step by step, we even uh, added very, very cool feature, like, for example, uh, Delta Backup, which is really useful when, uh, after the first backup, you just send the difference uh, from, from your VM the, the next time. Uh, we got a lot of adoption, et cetera. I would say, OK, that's cool. Uh, it worked. And the idea was to leverage the potential of Zen Server by using its API. So this is about the context, OK? So what about XCPNG? Uh, what the connection between uh, Zen Orchestra and XCPNG and all this stuff? So XCPNG is basically a fork of Zen Server because all the shortcomings uh, in the project management have you seen before. Uh, we get the code from Zen Server and we built it ourselves and we redistribute it. This is what you do when you do a fork, okay? Uh, why it's called XCPNG? Because before Zen Server was open source, uh, you, you had a, an open source version of Zen Server which called XCP, but it didn't work. And the reason is pretty clear. They tried to make it work as an open, as an open source solution, but without any you know culture of open source in the company in Citrix, it's really hard to get people on board because they don't know how it works, how open source works. So it's basically XCP plus next generation. So it explains the name. And why we decided to do that? Well, uh, as I said, we are mainly selling the open source solution uh, Zen Orchestra, which is on top of Zen Server. So. When they killed the free tier of uh, Zen Server, the, it was really a threat, basically a business threat for a business because a vast majority of Zen Orchestra users were using Zen Server free. So you can imagine that people were telling, well, I don't want to pay for, for this, then uh, we'll go to another hypervisor. And Zen Orchestra is working with Zen Server and not something else. So our first idea was to make something that will protect us uh, in the way that, OK, if you want to leave Zen Server, then go to XCPNG. It's free, and you don't have anything to pay. It will have access to all the features that you need to run your server virtualization stuff. So that, that's why I call this a defensive move, OK? So before doing that, because doing a fork is not something that you <laughs> decide uh, just one day and, and do like this, uh, we decided to make some, uh, you know, uh, thinking and, you know, having some metrics if people are really interested about the concept of doing uh, XCPNG. Uh, it can sound strange because, you know, you are telling about forking an hypervisor uh, in 2018, which is, I, I, I would say, um, well, in 2008, that could be trendy, you know, uh, to, to tell you you are launching a new hypervisor. but 
everyone is talking about Docker and serverless and cloud and stuff. So it, even myself, I wasn't convinced that uh, enough people could be interested about the idea to, to, to do that. So we decided to, to make a small Kickstarter campaign with the uh, uh, 6,000 euros uh, to start at the initial goal to say, OK, if we have enough money, uh, we can at least take some people and make work them on the ID, on the prototype of a fork, etc. And so we will try to see if people are interested by that. And uh, I, I've been really stunned because a lot of people answered the call of XCPNG and uh, it was a really big success. The Kickstarter campaign was really a big success. And, and you don't even have the complete amount here on the graph because some companies couldn't be able to pay uh, by credit card. So they did a wire transfer. So in the end, uh, uh, we managed to get a lot of resources to start the project. And we started to wonder, you know, uh, maybe there is something to do that it's just more than a defensive move. Because uh, if there is so many people interested by the concept, why not going further than that? So we've been from a threat to an opportunity. So an opportunity to do what exactly? Well, uh, the opportunity to tackle all the uh, limitation and the problems that you yeah, you have in Zen server previously. So, um, in a purely business perspective, it's also interesting for us because we are selling uh, a kind of V center for it. And then, if we can manage to also, uh, uh, you know, have the uh, capabilities to work underneath on the hypervisor level, so it makes sense for us to have some kind, for example, a bundle of uh, the hypervisor and the management interface. But outside that. Um, it also opens the door to uh, innovation inside uh, XCPNG itself. I mean, by that, if, if we start to understand how it's built, then we can improve it, we can contribute, we can add features, we can fix bugs. So all the limitation that you have previously with Zen Server only built by one company, which is Citrix, can be removed by doing something that's built by the community. So the uh, first example here was to replace the clumsy um, pack update system by doing the classical yum way, but s still getting in mind that people don't want to uh, have uh, all the stuff by themselves, they want to have something turnkey. So we exposed the yum command from uh, the web UI of Zen Orchestra. So you have a, you know, here a red dot telling that you need to patch your hosts, or you have a button in the interface to patch, to update all your hosts at once. So you just have to click, and then it will tell the API to uh, make a yum update, and that's it. So you can keep the turnkey solution, and at the same time being close to the upstream and more closer to uh, CentOS in this case. Or, uh, so we, we just, when there is an update basically done by Citrix, we get the RPMs, uh, we check them, and then we put them in our own uh, XCPNG repository. So, and as soon as we've uh, we done that, all the people can see uh, the updates directly from uh, the web UI or by typing yum updates inside uh, the, Zen the XCPNG hosts. So, since the, last, the first release in April, we did a lot of stuff. So uh, more than I was even dreamed of. Uh, so as I said, we uh, improved the update mechanism, but we did more than that. Uh, we removed all the license features. So we had to replace a license daemon by something that just answer yes every time, <laughs> and it works. Uh, you can upgrade for all the Zen server version, all the previous or existing Zen server versions without losing all your uh, VMs storage or whatever. So if you have a house with, let's say, 100 VMs, you just insert the ISO, uh, you follow uh, the instruction, and you reboot, and that's it. You are an XCPNG, and you can boot your VMs, and that's it. There is no complicated migration path. It's transparent. We also started to play with uh, other uh, uh, storage systems. So we played with ZFS and Ceph to integrate them directly into XCPNG, something that Citrix isn't willing to do for uh, multiple reasons, mainly political and marketing, not really marketing, but product management reasons. Uh, we added a, a, a way to, um, to create a software read during the installation. So if you don't have a hardware uh, read into your server, but you have two disks, and you can decide to use both to make a red one on your system. Uh, cloud side compatibility was added by uh, ShapeBlue. So that's really cool. And also, someone in the community decided to uh, fork the uh, Zen Center client on Windows and to create XCPNG Center. That's not us, but 
that's great because, well, we have people in the community uh, actually doing some work. So it's not just our work, it's a teamwork between all the people that want to participate. Uh, other fun stuff is um, we finally made some, to have some code that we did integrated in Zen Server. Um, we managed to do that because we found a lot of bugs that we fixed. So, well, Citrix uh, couldn't refuse to <laughs> integrate something that fixed their own product. So they decided to merge some of uh, our pull requests. We did things correctly on GitHub. We made a pull request, we signed the pull request, etc. So uh, some of our code is already merged uh, in the last uh, Zen server version, 7.6. We also find some bugs that we fixed faster than Citrix. Uh, by that I mean we wrote the fix and we created the patch and we've created the RPMs and the XCPNG users were able to have the updates without waiting uh, for Citrix to get a new release because Citrix and the PAX system it is it's clumsy and you have to wait a bit to have an update. They won't push a pack without having multiple fixes at the same time because uh, it takes time to make the update. So we are more flexible and we can push uh, um, fixes faster than Citrix can, can do. And for security patches, we are uh, something like 24 hours uh, after Citrix is releasing it. Time to get the patches, to check it. But anyway, we, we can uh, uh, follow the pace of Citrix for stuff they are doing, but they can't follow our pace. Uh, what's great with XCPNG is the community. This is, I, I would say, the, the central piece of why XCPNG is great, because um, I was surprised that a lot of people were interested, but not just interested, I, I will take the product, use it for free, and that's it. Uh, um, I really felt that a lot of frustration for all the previous years of using Zen Server and telling Citrix that they need this and they need that, and they didn't move at all. And then finally there is someone to hear and to try to find solution and to tell people, okay, you want that, I can do that, but you can at least create an issue. Uh, we can fi try to find people to help. And then there is someone on the forum coming, oh, I know this technology, I can make a patch if you like. Then we will push that into the testing repository and they will discuss for days, oh, this works, this doesn't work, etc. And there is really something going on, uh, uh, on both on the forum and GitHub. So it's not just us. Uh, uh, in the company, it's, it's really more uh, people who appropriate uh, XCPNG and, and run it and, and try to, to play with it. Also, we, we have some, uh, a growing ecosystem. Some people uh, add patches to be compatible with XCPNG. Uh, I said CloudStack, but there is also some uh, on Puppet Factor. Uh, people added uh, the XCPNG name to be able to get uh, you know, uh, information about the host and, and get a, a kind of a report on the infrastructure. So. This is also interesting because it's not just on the XCPNG level, but all around on the, the whole ecosystem. So what's next for XCPNG? Um, well, we want to continue to grow the team working on it. For now, it's a small team. I would say maybe three, four people working on it uh, full time uh, very recently. Uh, so as you can see, we did a lot of stuff with uh, a few people, so it could be really interesting. We want to stay uh, close at the upstream as possible, and I said upstream, I said both CentOS from the side, but also Zen server itself. So when we have some patches, every time we want to share them with Citrix to be able to Citrix to merge those, those patches, and so we will keep a low difference between uh, Zen server and XCPNG, at least for core features. Um, and to sum up, I would say, I would give some example. For example, we are working on um, in improving the uh, VM export uh, speed and capabilities by uh, adding the uh, ZSTD compression, which is made by Facebook, which is really, really interesting compression uh, algorithm. And uh, we could cut the uh, export time and then the backup time by a factor of 10 against uh, the uh, normal uh, JZIP compression. Also having uh, um, improved snapshot mechanism that excludes some disks uh, inside the VM that could be really interesting also for Zen Orchestra, which is relying on snapshot to make backups. So as you can see, the, the, there's a lot of uh, interesting synergies that we can do between XCPNG, Zen Orchestra, and also maybe uh, in the future, we hope, with, uh, with CloudStack. Because again, uh, we are a component that's 
top of uh, XCPNG. So we could imagine to do a lot of stuff, really interesting stuff. And also something that we discovered, uh, I would say almost by accident, but when we started to uh, talk about the idea of forking and to make XCPNG, we got actually some people coming to us and said, okay, that's great, I want to do that, but I want to run this without having support. So are you delivering support, guys? And we had to say, well, okay, let's do that. I mean, it makes sense because uh, we have people actually working into the code. We have people, uh, people able to fix problems uh, inside XCPNG. So why not using that to provide uh, a support to, be, uh, to run XCPNG confidently in, into production? So we started to, uh, to do that. Maybe we started officially uh, one or two months ago to set support for it. it. It's entirely based on uh, support model. So you don't have feature restriction or whatever. It's if you want to support a host or a pool in production, then uh, we can do that. OK, um, you will probably have some question, but I can uh, answer uh, this one. Is there a shared feature with Zen server? Um, it's a complicated question. We'll try to get uh, as close as possible to Zen server to be compatible. We can be compatible on everything, for example, on uh, the uh, vGPU for NVIDIA stuff, because this is not open source, so we can't do that. But otherwise, uh, the API won't change a lot, even in the next year, and the API itself is fully open source. So we'll be. Uh, 99% compatible with Zen server for years to come. So uh, we know that if we make some uh, patches and if we fix some problem, it will be uh, merged inside Zen server. But for new features, for example, ZFS, Ceph support, etc., uh, it's very likely it won't be integrated in Zen server. But it, it doesn't really matter when you add stuff that's not into Zen server. It's, it's better for us. OK, so uh, do you have uh, questions? No question? Yes. Um, when you put in an XCP node, is there a new, is there a version of, say, all the Zen server you have to be on to live migrate into the new version? Uh, you not live migrate to? Okay. Uh, Basically, we are following right now the uh, release cycle of Citrix. So, uh, for example, they got uh, Zen Server 7.5, then we got XCP 7.5, and then you can migrate from a Zen Server host, live migrate from a Zen Server host to XCPNG hosts if uh, they are uh, the same version or if Zen Server is older version. But like in Zen Server, you can do the opposite, um, meaning that you can't migrate a VM from a newer to an older host. But otherwise, you can live migrate between Zen Server and XCPNG. So you can even test in to your lab, migrate some VMs. If you're happy with it, that's fine. If you are not, you can migrate back in live. So it's really, really easy to test uh, into your environment. Is that, so on the, say, the source, so you're going from Zen Server to XCP, mm -hmm. what's the newest, what's the oldest X, um, Zen Server version you'd support for the live migrate? Uh, that's a good question. I would say uh, live migrate should work from at least 6.5. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. 6.5 should be fine. Before, I'm not sure. It's really, really old. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just discovered that. <laughs> so uh, it could be interesting, yeah, to, to discuss about uh, how we do backups on Zen 7 XCP engine and how it could be plugged somehow to, uh, to CloudStack. To be fair, uh, uh, I never use CloudStack. Uh, I heard of it, obviously. I know how it works. Uh, I would say the big lines, you know, but, but uh, I, I've never used it. So uh, what I heard that is there is a lot of interesting stuff that we could help or uh, on the other way could be done uh, uh, because we have a uh, huge knowledge on uh, Zen Server and now XCPNG. So we could even, you know, uh, maybe help to uh, add some code inside X XCPNG to improve CloudStack support or into that direction. That could be possible. So yeah, we will have to, to discuss that, but it could be interesting. Yeah. Yes? At which point are you going to say, hang on, I can do a better job than Centrix? and uh, just trying to maintain Citrix compatibility is just becoming a, a clamber on my foot. I can do that better. I, I'm just going to go and do, do my own thing and create a better hypervisor. Mm, that, that's a good question. Well, I would say that uh, thanks to the flexibility, 
uh, of, for example, migrating from a storage to another. If we wrote, wrote another storage plugin, then we don't really care about the fact that if you migrate from Zen Server to XCPNG, uh, the storage API would be the same. If, for example, if we integrate ZFS, uh, it will even work if we took the ZFS driver and put it inside Zen Server. So, because it's all using uh, the glue around, uh, I would say there is no compatibility issues that I can imagine for now. So maybe in four or five years, that will change something deeply, but uh, it won't be for, for tomorrow. So I don't think that there is any issue to be compatible, uh, at least for the next years, in any way. Yeah, I guess my question is more, when do you say I don't care if it's compatible anymore because my hypervisor is better than them? So. Well, <laughs> depends of the, the pace of how Citrix is developing new features. Uh, I'm not really concerned. <laughs> um, also, a, a large part of the code they have to do is open source. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's complicated, but it's not rocket science. I mean, in the end, you have to deal with the kernel, QMU, and uh, this is something that uh, everyone is doing from KVM to whatever. So. Uh, I think we can always figure it out uh, a, a way to be somehow compatible, and then when we decide we won't be compatible, it will be a big choice, and uh, we will, you know, uh, prepare people for that. But it's not in the plan for now because it seems uh, not not an issue for now. Yes. Uh, with the new uh, YAM update. Yeah. Option, is it still? First master and then yeah, place, so this is for a, a very simple practical reason is um, the master uh, always uh, has the true uh, the truth uh, the, the database on the master is important so every time you update it, it doesn't matter if you don't reboot for example you can yum update your slave uh, then a master but as soon as you re will restart the tool stack or reboot a host you always have to start from the master because otherwise a slave can connect to the master database and then it would say i can do that so this is always the same thing uh, when you click on uh, for example you got i don't say 200 hosts connected to xanarchist range and you click on update all well then you have to reboot all the master first uh, we can uh, have more automation around that, but this is something that the administrator have to have to know because this is really important. When, when you want to get close to the CentOS uh, yeah. uh, version, so after each kernel update, I need to reboot, right? Yeah. So reboots will be performed more often than send server updates because send server updates doesn't. Um, we we can. Difference? When I say close to CentOS, is for all the non uh, really critical uh, packages like the hypervisor and the kernel. Uh, for now, you can't use a, a recent, very recent kernel. It's 4.4, I think, uh, in, uh, in Zen 7 XCPNG because of a lot of patches uh, on top of it. So for now, we are more following uh, the um, updates from Citrix regarding those packages until we got enough uh, you know, know how to do that by ourselves. We are already working on that because, for example, people who want to play with Ceph need a very recent kernel. So there is actually some community and even one, one person from, a, from our company working on trying to integrate a more recent kernel. But there is maybe 200 and between 200 and 300 patches uh, on the Linux kernel. So when you have to apply those patches on a more recent kernel, it could be really a headache because you need to understand what, which uh, uh, patch is doing what in the new kernel, if the new options are available, etc. So we need to, to learn more about that before be able to, to have, for example, a kernel that we released and not Citrix decided to release. Okay, thank you.